beautiful sunshiny day today amen one more reason to praise the Lord so let's stand we're gonna sing 10,000 reasons 10,000 reasons bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i'll worship your holy name the sun comes up it's a new day dawning it's time to sing song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord O oh my soul O oh my soul worship his holy So we're going to sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace.
All right. It's good to see everybody here today. Thank you for being in the services. I had a request to go through Psalm 23 before our prayer time. This is Isabel's husband's favorite psalm, so sort of in memory of Bob, so we want to do that today. Psalm 23, you can read along with me if you would like, or just listen as we go through it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, for his name's sake. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. It's a great psalm. Very important. David, as a shepherd, would write that to say, I'm willing to follow the greatest shepherd. And you know, in John, Jesus says, I am the shepherd, and I watch over my flock. And those that are my sheep will hear my voice and follow me. So I'm happy to be one of his sheep and to follow him. Amen. Know that he's with me all the time. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's talk about praises and prayers. Trish is back today, doing much better. We're glad for that. She's still having to see the doctor about some other issues, but keep her in prayer. And Virgil was able to get out of the hospital. Uh, he's watching his grandchildren this morning, so he couldn't be here. But he said, I'll be back Wednesday night. Um, Yvonne, I called her. Some of you remember Yvonne and Debbie. Yvonne has had pneumonia. She said, Pastor, I went and got the shot for pneumonia. And then I caught it about a week later. So uh, she said that she's doing better. I had a good post-op report last Monday morning. So it's almost been three weeks since I had my hernia surgery. And I'm praising God. I feel really good. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to stand up as long as I can today. All right? Not that it makes it any different if I sit down. It's just something that's ingrained in me. It just feels weird. I've gotten used to sitting down. I'm going to try standing up. Vanessa got a job, amen, and she started working, all right, and uh, the Bradshaws are all feeling better, they were under the, under the weather, and uh, Ricardo told us that his daughter was sick several days, stomach issues, and uh, she's doing better, so we're thankful for that. Thankful for traveling mercies, Darcy and I went to LA on Friday, and others have traveled, um, we have some missing from us today because of this or that reason, but we're glad that you're here. Other answers to prayer today? Yes? Raymond's home. Raymond has finished training, initial training, and then he is officially set for tanks, armored. But he's through that, and now he's going to be going to uh, North Carolina for Airborne. So he's not going to jump out of a plane in a tank, but, <laughs> but that's great that he got, he, they thought enough of him, and so it's good to see him and Virginia today. So amen for that with Raymond. All right, Katie? Okay. All right, so that's thankful that he can go back to work after the 25th. Um, we praise the Lord for that. All right, all others, answer to prayer, praise the Lord. Yes, sir? Okay, David's going to go back to school, that's great. Okay. Okay, work with eyesight. Yes, Jerry? Amen. 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 That's great to hear. We've been praying that he would get into rehab, so we're glad to hear that. All right. Um, I know that Paulina appreciates your prayers. Her dad passed away. Wednesday was the viewing and the service, and they may not be here today because I know they were going to have another service in Mexico, um, but uh, uh, she appreciates the prayers, and, 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 and Mildred, Jerry's uh, sister, is doing really well with her recovery from her 
hip replacement and then fracture of the other hip. So she said she's getting along with it. So, And what you were telling me about someone else in your family that had... Right, that we were praying for. Okay, so that's Jerry's grandson-in-law. Somebody said if it's a granddaughter's brother, it must be his grandson. It's a grand uh, grandson-in-law, I guess you could say. And uh, he was coughing up blood, and so they did two surgeries, gallbladder, bile duct, things like that. So he's doing better, so we're glad for that. We prayed for that on Wednesday night. All right, I, I know that people had a good time. We had the baptism the other day. That was great to baptize one. Always a blessing. So, anybody else with an answer to prayer? It's a gorgeous day after the rain and the wind and the cold. It's nice. All right, so we want to pray for these things. Uh, continue to pray for uh, Virgil. They have told him that he has congestive heart failure. So, we need to pray for Virgil along with a valve issue. For Trish, as she continues to see the doctor. Juana has seen her doctor and is doing better, but keep her in prayer as well. Amen. And uh, we want to pray for Jerry's son that he'll stick with his rehab, but pray for Irene's daughter that's struggling with addictions as well. And for Lori Morales, we want to pray for her. All right. And pray for Tina with her foot. Darcy. Donna, has to have surgery tomorrow. Donna Fletcher. Yes. Okay. We'll pray for back surgery for Donna Fletcher. And uh, continue to pray for those that need work. The Lord will open up doors of opportunity. Unspoken requests, pray for them. And also spiritual needs for families of individuals that need Christ, as well as people that need to be just in church. I pray that as we do community stuff that people will see that they need Jesus and that we can share Jesus, all right? Um, any other prayer requests? All right, well, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we come humbly before you today, thanking you for the fact that it's such a beautiful day, that you gave us great weather and that you've been with us and helped us through. Uh, thank you for all the blessings, for traveling mercies, people going back to work, people out of the hospital and feeling better. Uh, we are thanking you for how you've been working in Raymond's life and ask that you continue to do so. We're thankful for Vanessa's job, for Bella doing better. We're thankful for that. Uh, we're thankful for this young man that is now in rehab, Lord. We pray for him, that you might help him. Also, Irene's daughter, as she needs to get her life straightened out. Um, we are, Lord, thanking you for just all that you do, for uh, uh, Jerry's grandson-in-law and his health issues that you were there with him and Mildred as well uh, we pray for uh, continue to pray for Isabel's family with her husband passing and also for Paulina's family with her dad passing and the services they've been doing we just ask that you might continue to work and strengthen them be with Donna as she has surgery be with uh, also Virgil as he's waiting to hear uh, we're thankful for the good report for Gail Ledbetter uh, with the cancer removal, and we pray for her for a, a quick recovery. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for uh, all that you do for us and help us. We pray for the lost, those that need Jesus, family members and friends, that we might be the one to share Jesus with them. We also would pray, Lord, that you might be uh, with those that are struggling with addiction. We pray for set free and those that go through that program. Just bless them, we pray, and help them. Uh, we, Lord, pray for uh, others for Tina with her foot. Uh, we pray for uh, Damien that everything will segue into him going back to work. We pray for those with cancer that you might be with them. Uh, Lord, we ask that you might help our church to be impactful. 
uh, we as individuals in the community, but also for our church. That, Lord, that uh, people will know that God loves them and that you sent your son to die for them and uh, people will be willing to have their lives changed because of Jesus Christ. We thank you for these things and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we'll see how long I can stand up. All right. Ingredients for a great church. We've been talking an awful lot about ingredients and importance. So this past week, um, I have a friend. She's been here in church. I've known her since the late 70s. And uh, she's a friend of the family. She's a friend of Darcy. And she came to church a few weeks ago. But it was her birthday. And so she was coming to the house on Wednesday night. And we're like, Darcy goes, go get a cake. Go get a cake. And I'm like, well, what kind of cake does she like? You know, there's so many kinds of cake. Ice cream cake, chocolate, vanilla with chocolate frosting, carrot cake. What does she like? And uh, I left my phone at home. So I got to the store and I'm like, I was close enough I could come to the church and I called her and I said, have you found out what kind she likes? And her sister hadn't responded yet, so I'm like, okay, I'll go get, it won't be a sheet cake, it'll be a nice cake. So I got like a, it was called a chocolate truffle cake, all right? I have tres leches, tiramisu, I mean, what, a fancy one, right? So I get it home, uh, apparently it wasn't the kind she liked because I got one with whipped topping she likes one like a white cake with buttercream frosting. So you know how that goes when you're trying to do something for somebody and you're not sure of exactly what you're supposed to do. Because, you know, telephones are sometimes a problem because they act like leashes or they can distract us. But they're also a tremendous blessing because I didn't want to go back to the store again. Now, somebody else picked up the right cake for her, but... I, I messed up the ingredients of helping her. And she said, well, it really doesn't matter. She worked on her birthday anyway. She said, you know, when you get to a certain age, who cares? You just do it, right? Um, so we did get together with her sister last night and had a good time. Uh, but uh, ingredients now for a little boy, Ezra's birthday is coming up here pretty quickly. And so we're having a wee-woo party. And you say, what's a wee-woo? Well, he calls that a siren, okay? And he is enamored with that, except when they pull up in the church parking lot that he's embarrassed to go over and see him for some reason. He's suddenly shy. Uh, he, but he knows what they're connected with. We were talking about his dad taking something away from him, and it was his dad a thief. You know, he shouldn't take it because he's a thief. And Ezra's, Ezra's like calling on his phone, you know, and he goes, policeman, there's a thief. And I'm like, wow, for a three-year-old, that's pretty good. But let's not teach him how to call 911 on the real phone. Okay? But his birthday party's coming up. It's going to be just a little thing. It's not going to be a big thing. But he will care about the ingredients for his birthday, right? But when you get older, you get gracious. And if your family doesn't get you exactly what you want, you smile and you're nice about it anyway, right? So that sort of talks about where we're going to go with the ingredients for a church that we find in Acts chapter 2 today, which is making a good impact in our community. Making a good impact in our community. Now, the Lord has helped me lead our church into making some good impact in our community. At the yard sale, a lady came and was looking at stuff, and she goes, you're the guy that stands out with the smile sign. She goes, I used to honk and wave when I was taking my kids to the middle school and then I took them to the high school and she goes, I don't drive by, do you still do that? And we're like, yeah, we still do it on Mondays when school is in session. She goes, that's neat. I appreciated that. And so we get that, but we're going to be doing some stuff at the elementary school again. They've asked us to have the movie night and popcorn They've, and we're going to be doing a teacher appreciation thing. And so uh, what kind of an impact? Somebody said, you can truly tell what your church is doing in a community if your church should suddenly close the doors and not have church anymore. Would anybody in the community notice? Would anybody in the community notice? And that's a very good question. We we'll, won't read all of these verses. We're getting now down towards the end of this. And it says... 
continuing daily with one accord in the temple. They were meeting together, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. That's having a good impact on the community. This early church started about A.D. 33, and it's in Acts chapter 2. The first big revival they had was on the day of Pentecost, not a revival, but evangelistic effort. 3,000 people were baptized that day, so there was a lot of people that got saved. And they began to grow as a church. And they had all the ingredients that we talked about. Reading the Bible and studying the Bible and having fellowship together and all those things. And they began to impact their community. Church historians tell us that by the time the Sanhedrin in like chapter 6 or 7 of Acts says, quit talking about Jesus so much. You're causing a problem. You've turned the city upside down that perhaps as much as half of the population of Jerusalem were believers. Okay? Here, and we're going to look at this next week, the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. One place it says another 5,000, another it gives another. It says there's like we couldn't tell you the numbers of people. So there was a lot of people coming to Christ because the church was making a good impact. Now, the church is not the building, it's us. Okay? So, corporately, together, when we do something, like we had the yard sale, and we were raising money for missions, and we took the opportunity, at least I hope you did, to be friendly to people that came on our property. But we also need to think about some things that we need to do to make a good impact on our community, you as an individual as well. Do people in your immediate neighborhood know that you're a Christian? Because of a bumper sticker on your car? Because of the ways that you act towards them? Somebody said, a lot of people can guess that you're a Christian because you disappear dressed up really nice on Sunday morning for a couple of hours. They're not thinking you're going to the theater or the baseball game. They're thinking you're probably going to church. They may or may not notice. They may not be out of bed yet. But I have some things that I think that is important for us to use to let our community know about Jesus and about the difference that He can make in their lives. That's how having favor. That means that they looked highly upon that early church. So the first thing is, is that we need to do is whatever sin is embedded in our lives, we're working to conquer it through the power of the Holy Spirit who convicts us. And then, okay, I know this is wrong. I need to change my life. If you have been involved in business in the world, you find out real fast that there are people that, whether they're the operator of the business, the owner of the business, that they might be a little dishonest. You ever run across that? Where you're dealing with somebody and you find out that they're dishonest, that they're a liar? Or they have hatred towards somebody? Or there's always this coming up where people are being busted as employees because they steal. I remember a young lady in my youth group went to work at one of the major companies. I don't remember if it was Macy's or J.C. Penney's. And she worked there as a cashier for a while. And then before long, she said, I don't have my job. Well, why not? Well, because my, cash, my register was always short. I don't think it was because she had a problem with math because they had started working it to where you put in the amount and it tells you how much change you should give them. You didn't have to figure it out mentally or on a calculator that was keeping track of her sales and they said you've been putting money in your pocket okay well those are two big things that we should be conquered as christians we shouldn't be liars we shouldn't be dishonest uh, we shouldn't be thieves okay 
So, I mean, if we want to make an impact on the community, the right impact is I will help you with your UPS package, but I'm not going to steal it off your porch and take it home because you're never going to know what you're going to get from Amazon, right? Could be dog food, could be a flea collar, could be something nice. But see, in their world and in the world we're in, let's face it, today, people are dishonest. God had to tell them in the Old Testament don't have a dishonest weight on your scale. We joke around about going to the neighborhood butcher and saying, I need two pounds of meat, and he's got his thumb on the scale while he's serving you at one pound, and it looks like two pounds. God said, I hate that. I want the scales to be honest. I want the right weight. And so as we deal with people, we should be honest. We shouldn't lie. We shouldn't show hatred. We should be different than the rest of the world. So here's some verses that talk about this. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. What does it mean, holy? It means without sin. All right? God is holy. He makes us to be holy. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. So God says... I want you to cease from sin. Now that's a theme in the New Testament, right? I'm saved, I come to Jesus, and I have all my past forgiven. Once my past is forgiven, I become a new creation in Jesus Christ. Old things are passed away, all things become new. So therefore, I shouldn't be a liar, I shouldn't be a thief, I shouldn't be an adulterer. I should live for God. Live like Jesus, right? Like he's there in my life. I need to live differently. So he says, Peter says, God says, don't be involved with what the world is being involved with. Be different. I can't say that I've ever been tested by somebody at a cash register to see if I would, you know, hey, this guy's a minister. I want to see if he'll give me back if I give him too much change. But there have been occasions that I have been given back too much. And I said, you know what? This is not mine. I should only get this amount. You gave me too much money. Now, I normally nowadays only deal with a debit card or a credit card. I'm not using cash. But have you ever had that occasion where they gave you too much change? (laughs) Now, okay, so you admitted to that. But I'm not going to ask you to admit to whether or not you gave them back. Or if you just said, hey, 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 I've got some free spending money today. I will say this. I worked a cash register for quite a while. And my bosses always said, you know what? You're honest and you're just within pennies all the time. Right on. Right on. That's because I was raised to honor God and to be honest. All right? Sometimes being honest and telling the truth is painful, right? You go in somewhere and they say, okay, is that actually what happened? And you're like, do I be honest about it? If it might hurt my ability. I knew somebody that told me one time, okay, it broke. I didn't have a warranty on it, but they still sell them at the store. So let's go back to the store and get a new one And we'll put the broken one in the box and we'll go right back within like the same day so that Walmart thinks we're just returning the one that was broken in the box. And I'm sure Virginia has worked that side of the world. I'm sure they got a lot of stuff like that. And I thought, well, that's dishonest. Because the old one broke and I'm buying a new one. I'd have to buy a new one anyway, but to say, well, I'm going to put the old one back in and pretend there's no difference. Hmm. 
We need to stay away from sin if we're going to make an impact. Because the world is full of sin, right? There's liars, there's thieves, there's haters. All that stuff is out there in the world. We need to live differently as a church together, but as individuals. What else does it say? In Romans chapter 13, 11 through 14. Do this knowing the time that it's now high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And folks, if you're aware of what's going on in Israel right now, somebody said it's going to be perfect for someone to step up and say, I can make peace for seven years. And that'll be the Antichrist. Okay? The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. So let's Make an impact by not sin, without sin. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. So, again, it's reiterating, it's telling us again, it's repeating, don't sin if you want to make an impact. Now, God wants us to be holy as He is holy. But then that is then reflected out. We're His ambassadors. We're His chosen people. Do you ever have somebody in your family say, honor your family name. We don't do that. Do you ever hear that as a child? I would ask to do something and my parents would say no. And I'd say, but so-and-so and so-and-so is doing that. And my dad would say, if they were jumping off a bridge, would you want to go jump off the bridge too? And Well, no. Well, then don't say that. He said, you're a hatch. You're a Christian. What does God want you to do? Okay, so he would put a guilt trip on me. And now that I'm older, the Holy Spirit says, oh, by the way, you shouldn't act that way. And we talked about this before. It's a little hard if you're... Uh, angry at a customer service representative and then oh by the way i'm a christian mm. don't be wearing that cross around your neck and go cuss out now at least take it i'm joking <laughs> you should live differently where they can notice it's like having the wrong stickers on your car and doing the wrong thing well the right stickers i guess galatians 5 verses 16 through 17 i say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Paul said it's a constant struggle. Uh, the things that I should do, I don't. And the things that I shouldn't do, I do. So yes, it's a struggle, but we should be striving to reach it. Following the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit, when He says, do this, do this, that is going to help us be making an impact in our community because everybody else is doing sinful things and we're not. My uncle was following a car or he was driving down the street and he found a little deposit bag laying in the road. He picked it up. And there was like $20,000 in it. It was some huge amount. I know $20,000 is not much, but it was, it was not $500 or $200. It was like thousands. And he had a deposit slip, and so he did his best to return it to the bank or to the police department so he could go where it was supposed to go. And he was written up in the newspaper in his community because Augusta Man returns. Now, he worked in the military. He was in the Air Force. I'm not sure of his official, uh, he was an officer. It was his job to go to the bases and root out corruption. So he wasn't liked by a lot of the quartermasters and supply chain guys because they were selling stuff that they had stolen, and so he'd get in there and get the corruption gone. But he was a believer. He was a believer, and the government appreciated him for doing that, but then... And he's like, it's no big deal. That's what you're supposed to do, right? Not pocket the money and say, oh, too bad. You're supposed to return it. That's what our Christian is supposed to do. 
Because he was convicted by the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, as we work to get rid of the sin, then we are also doing observable good works. Observable good works. So that people can see that we're doing something good. I appreciated somebody that texted me when I was going through. Uh, I appreciate their heart. But they said, sending good thoughts. Okay, if you want to say that's prayer, that's fine. But if I say that I'm going to pray for you, and, and I prayed for our neighbors. Our neighbor was getting ready to have a kidney stone surgery, and so I gathered with her, and her, with her and her husband, and I prayed for them. He texted me and said, hey, she did well. The surgery went great. Thanks for the prayer. Observable good works. Jerry and I are, and Mike are normally out here on Monday mornings uh, with coffee and prayer. And if people are driving by and we're flipping them off or they come in for coffee and prayer and we say, we don't like the way you look, the way you smell, we're not going to help you out, that's wrong. Right? Because we're in front of a church. Okay? I, I guess there's a new popular thing. I don't know how long it's been around, but uh, you, certain bars you go in there and there's some kind of a drink you get, and after you get your drink, the bartender or the cocktail waitress slaps you as hard as they can. And I'm like, wow, okay. There's also a restaurant, I won't name it, but I guess they insult you the whole time you're there. I, that's, I mean, it's bad enough to go to a restaurant sometimes anyway and have to wear a hat that has a, a bad name for you and... We should be doing observable good works. Now, there are people out in public that do good things. The other morning, as I was leaving and doing some things, I noticed people uh, running a marathon up Broadway, and it was one about cancer. Okay, that's a good work to, to raise money to, for cancer, uh, to fight against cancer. But what are we doing that people can say? Have you mowed your neighbor's grass or put out their trash? If you've done something that they can see, we thought, find this, but we'll go back to 1 Peter. Having your conduct, how you live, honorable among the Gentiles. That they say, wow, that person's doing good things. That when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, they will have a change. Your good conduct will be observable by what you're doing. Instead of, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to pray and to read your Bible and to give, give towards missions or whatever you choose to give towards. It's, those are good things. But then to help somebody out if you see them in need, you know, whether it's buying their lunch or Seeing somebody panhandling, hey, let me, give you some, let me give you some food. You know, doing something to your neighbors, to your coworkers, to your friends, that's observable. Jesus addressed this in Matthew chapter 5. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. There are 50,000 uses for salt. I don't have time to give you all of them. Most of us are commonly known for seasoning the food, right? Just right is the right amount. Too much, it's too salty, right? We can use it for preservation. They salt hams and other things. But then if you grow up where there's ice... They throw salt down on the ice to melt it to allow you to get around easier. Okay? So if salt is no good, but he said, you're the salt of the earth. What are you doing? You are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand it gives light to all who are in the house. So we're a light. Now, as this world gets darker and darker... With sin and unrighteousness, the more we will stand out for doing the right thing. I don't want to stand out. I want to blend in. 
but we've been given the commandment to stand out. It's our job to represent Jesus Christ, whether good or to the point of being put in jail for representing Jesus Christ. That could happen. That could happen. If you were under arrest and on trial for being a Christian, would you have enough evidence to prove that you're a Christian, to convict you of that? Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. It gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So as you do observable good works, it's for people to see. To see and know that you're different from everybody else. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16 says this, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. That's doing the right thing. When was the last time we looked to seek justice? When was the last time we rebuked someone who was an oppressor? When did we defend the fatherless? When did we plead for the widow? The next thing for us to make an impact in our community is we are bringing glory to God. It's not for my glory. It's not for me. It's for me to give glory to God. In my office, I have a very nice little uh, plaque with a nice picture of the students from Hilltop Elementary. And they said, you are the volunteer of the year. And I wanted to say, but it wasn't me. It was the church, but we're doing it to bring glory to God, not to bring glory to me, okay? When I do things, I want to bring glory to God. It's because of God that I'm doing this, because God is asking me. Let's go back to 1 Peter. Glorify God in the day of visitation. Huh. I think of visitation, that means when I go around and visit people that are housebound or haven't been to church in a while, but that's not what it's saying. It's just saying when people see you, are you glorifying God? We read earlier that um, we should, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who... Who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God honor the king. Paul writes that if you are a slave owner, do the right thing to your slaves. If you're a slave, do the right thing that you should do. In that culture, they had slaves. It was an open thing. God was not condemning it. He wasn't condoning it. But he just said, whatever position you're in life, do the right thing where God has placed you. Now, I'm not going to talk about places that we put ourselves Right? Because we can get ourselves in a pretty sticky situation pretty quick. But we're just studying on Wednesday night and Monday morning about Joseph. Joseph was in Potiphar's household and he was given a lot of work and God blessed him and he was raised high in Potiphar's household. Potiphar's wife accused him falsely of rape and he was thrown in prison. He didn't give up and just language there. He did the most of it, and he became second in command of the prison. And God continued to honor him because he glorified God. So what are we doing to glorify God? How are we showing that? All right? It's not me. It's God. It's Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to 33, we read these things. Therefore, whether you eat 
or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do. I know that Katie remembers this very well. When we lived in Ohio, we took the youth to a place called Camp Choff, Christian Hall of Fame. It's in, the church is in Canton, Ohio. Uh, anybody know what Hall of Fame is in Canton, Ohio? Football Hall of Fame. So they had a Christian Hall of Fame. And as you walk around the church, you find paintings of strong Christians. John Knox, William Tyndale. And some of these names you're like, who's that? Okay, but older men of God and women of God that did great things. Missionaries, Bible translators. Okay, so it's the Christian Hall of Fame. So their youth camp became the Camp Christian Hall of Fame, Camp Choff. So Katie went there, and she remembers, and Raymond, I, I, you probably have a lot of times where in your training you had to line up before you went in to go to eat, right? Stand there until your, whoever's in charge says, okay, go inside and eat, right? Before we could go in and eat, we had to recite a verse. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That was pretty cool. That's sucking our minds. So you have less food fights, okay? Because the food fight's not necessarily glorifying to God, amen? amen. Katie, you remember re- saying those verses again and again and again? Yes. All right. But it's true. We should be giving glory to God. I mean, the, the car started when we got in it. That we have a bed to lay our head on. That we have good doctors or the good hospital to take care of us when we're in need. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. He goes, I'm giving glory to God so I don't give any offense to others so that people might come to Christ. Paul went to preach in a town that was heavily religious but didn't know the true God. The city was Athens. In Athens, they were a very advanced civilization. And so everywhere they went, they ran across all these false gods and they would set up an altar. All over Athens were altars to all of the Greek pantheon, the Roman pantheon, the Egyptian pantheon of gods, anywhere their civilization had touched. So everywhere you went, you'd see all these altars. So they're very religious. They had one that said it was set up to the unknown God. Now I've heard two things about that. One was that they just said, if there's any gods we've missed, we want to set it up for him or her. The other thing was, is that there was a bad epidemic in the city And there was a shepherd that was a foreigner that came along or someone that came along and prayed to Lord God Almighty. And the epidemic passed without much death. But they didn't ever find out the name and so they just said it's the unknown God. But Paul walks around the city and they had something called Mars Hill. And it's the pan... I can't even remember. I, I, I think it's called the Pantheon, where they would meet and they would discuss things. All right? And Paul gets up there, and he could have just railed on him. You are God dying and going to hell because you don't believe in the true God. But instead, he goes, I noticed the altar to the unknown God. He goes, I know who that is. Let me introduce him to you. So he brought glory to God in front of, and some said, okay, we believe you, and others said, no, we want to hear more. But he brought glory to God in that sort of a strange situation where people didn't want to believe in the true God. He wanted to see people get saved. We glorify him by doing this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. That's giving Him the glory, right? 
I am who I am as a Christian because of what Jesus did for me. Amen? He died on the cross for me. He rose again for me. And I am what I am because of Him. Unless I'm living in sin, unless I'm causing problems and not giving glory to God. I want to give glory to Him for what He's done. And so, I mean, I, you see today, I'm wearing a shirt that says Hilltop Baptist Church. I wear that as a representative of Hilltop Baptist Church. Years ago, we had a softball team. I don't know if, you, Virginia, you were attending when we had that softball team so many years ago. And we had a shirt. David, you were there. You played a little bit. It said Hilltop Baptist Church. Unfortunately, sometimes when we would play those games, uh, tempers would get a little heated. And I can't say we were always glorifying God. But it's important to always give glory to God, right? I was at Lake Milton Baptist Temple between 1999 and 2006. That's where we met Randy. And so I was talking to the pastor there and I said, have you guys ever thought about doing like a bumper sticker to put on people's cars? Follow me to church at Lake Milton Baptist Temple. And they said, yeah, one time we did license plate frames that said, follow me to Lake Milton Baptist Temple. And they handed them out. And I think some of the kids that were bus kids got a hold of some of them and took them home. And I think they put them on their mom and dad's car. Because I said, what happened? How come you guys still don't give them out? And they said, we spent all Sunday afternoon at a local drinking establishment where there was a bunch of cars parked in the bar that said, follow me to Lake Milton Baptist Temple. And so we were down there quietly unticking all those license plate frames off. Okay, I understand. I totally get it. I know why. All right. Now, whether you have a symbol on your car of a fish or Jesus loves you, I have one on my truck. He is greater than I. Okay? I ought to be different when I drive. Are people still going to get mad at me? Probably. But that means I shouldn't be showing things that a Christian shouldn't be showing as I drive down the road. I ran across a young lady that I went to high school with before Facebook got really big. And I, was, I wanted to be known as Walt Hatch because I wanted to sort of mature and have a nickname, not be called Walton anymore. But when I got to school that year, there was a guy by the name of Walt Boyette. Now, he was Walter, but he chose the nickname Walt. And so I couldn't go by Walt. But this lady that I met years later said... Hey, I know who you are. You're Walt. And what I remember about you, he, 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 is that, and this was big back in the late 70s, early 80s, if you mooned somebody. You know what that means? That means you drop trow and have a bare butt. She said, what I remember about you, Walt, is that you would moon people. I never. I said, you're thinking of the wrong Walt. I never, ever. I might have been tempted, but I said, you know what? I want to be in trouble with my parents because somehow they're going to find out. And I want to be in trouble with God because God knows. And people in the school know that I'm a pastor's son and they know that I love God. So, yeah. So I straightened her out. I said, you've got the wrong Walt. That's the other Walt that did. Oh, yeah. Okay, now I remember. But I want to have a good name. I want to make a good impact in my community. Not just because I'm a minister. I, I do bear that. I do bear that, that I'm a minister at Lake Milton Baptist Temple. And people, you know, if I come to pray with you in the hospital and oh, I'm your pastor, I maybe should pray for them too, right? If they're in a room with you. Because I'm representing Jesus Christ. But we all are. We all need to make a good impact in our community. 
So let's bow our heads for just a moment. I want to talk to you about this. Are you making a good impact? When Whatever you do in your retirement, in your work, in your leisure, in your community where you live, are you, do people know that you're a Christian? Well, I, I don't know how they're going to respond if they find out I'm a Christian, which should be a good response, and you can talk to them about Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you might help us to make a good impact in our community. That you might help us as we're here as a church corporately and doing things at the schools or in our neighborhood that people will know the reason we do it is because of God and because of Jesus Christ so that we can share Jesus Christ and show the difference that's been happening in our lives. But I pray for us individually, in our community, people we work with, go to school with, people that we, our family, that we see, that we will have a good impression on them because of Jesus Christ. And they'll see the difference that you made in our lives. Help us to grow to that, to making an impact in this community for the cause of Jesus Christ. And wherever we're at, Disneyland, SeaWorld, a baseball game, across the United States, Lord, on an airplane, however, that we might show you and give you glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a couple of announcements to bring to your attention. In the morning, we will have a donuts and coffee and prayer. Lord willing, we'll have donuts. at. Uh, we meet at 7.30 to 8.30. And then we'll have a uh, Bible study at 9 o'clock tomorrow for those of you that wish to come, and then again on Wednesday at 6.30. Next Sunday, we have a vacation Bible school meeting following the service. Uh, um, right, so if you're involved with vacation Bible school or want to be, right after our service, we're going to meet with the Spanish leaders as well. Um, leadership meeting says the th 23rd, if you're on the leadership team, we're actually meeting this week. So the 16th is when we're meeting here at the church at 6.30. And we'll have a church business meeting on the 28th. Uh, a couple of things for you to think about. Um, Sandy has been the church clerk for a very long time. Uh, church clerk basically is a representative that is on our notes with the government that she's 